I'd like to uh, present uh, Dr. Paolo de Mugadice. He's the coordinator of the Armenian Studies Program and director of the Center of Armenian Studies at Fresno State University. He has received his uh, uh, C Philosophy degree from UCLA in Armenian, and in, um, in Armenian Studies and he has taught courses in Armenian language, history, literature, culture, art, church, history and so on. So he's been teaching these courses for about 20 years. He has received an honorary doctorate from the Yerevan State University and also he has been honored by a St. Nerses Shnorhali Medal of, uh, and Encyclical from the Catholicos of all Armenians. Uh, Professor Devogadichia. Thank you and uh, good evening. So tonight I'm going to be speaking uh, in English and the topic is, uh, Mr. Panosian stated, is the theme of genocide in 20th century Armenian American literature. You see on the date that it says Wednesday, April 27th, because I gave actually a variation of this talk yesterday in Fresno as part of our lecture series which we have at Fresno State University. And uh, this is a topic that I have been working on now uh, for the past several years. Uh, the topic of more of the Armenian American literature, but because the Armenian Students Organization was sponsoring a series of events to commemorate the Armenian Genocide, uh, they asked me also to present something, and so that's why I developed this lecture, which I'm going to give to you tonight. And I want to thank Arpa and uh, Hago Panosian for inviting me. Actually, he's been trying to invite me for a long time. We actually saw each other in Armenia last year, I believe, or maybe the year before. And uh, he was always asking me to come, but it's difficult in the middle of the week for me to come from Fresno because I usually teach every day uh, in my courses, but it happened that tomorrow is the diocesan assembly of the Western Ar Ar Armenian Church, and so I'm participating in that, so I took the day off from school, and so I was able to come. In, uh, this is actually the second part of a lecture, which I, a second part of a two-part lecture series, which was, the first part was on Armenian American literature in general. So actually I gave that talk in February, and if we look at the first, the first uh, slide up here, it gives you uh, a listing of some of the first generation Armenian American writers. And so I'm going to begin talking and you can look at that list and I think it'll make sense in uh, what I was saying. In my previous lecture, which I gave in February, I discussed the beginnings of Armenian American literature, presenting some of the major themes that were reflected in the works of first generation writers. And I gave examples of excerpts from those writers to support my arguments concerning the various themes of importance to, to those writers. Many of these first generation Armenian writers shared common experiences, both in their lives and in their writings. They had either been born in historic Armenia or had come to the United States at an early age. Many of them wrote nostalgically about their childhood and about the land that they had left. This evening, I would like to look at the genocide as a theme in the writing of Armenian American literature, but primarily in the works of the second and third generation. Those that you see on the, on the slide are primarily first generation Armenian writers, American writers, and they are all writers who wrote in English. And generally it's considered that uh, William Saroyan was the first Armenian American writer, but David Cardian's book, Forgotten Bread, uh, gives that now to uh, Leon Sarabian Herald, who wrote poetry which was published in the 1920s. But that's really when Armenian American literature begins. So my talk is going to be about the second and third generation of those, but I'm going to give you a background so that we can understand where these writers began to, to do their uh, themes. This evening I would like to look at the genocide, as you mentioned that already, the catastrophic consequences of the genocide left their imprint in virtually all areas of Armenian life. And they also had an impact on the literature as a means of expression. My remarks tonight will not cover memoirs as a genre of genocide writing, nor will I discuss historical works, as those are topics for another lecture. 
The genocide, as pretty much all of you well know, had a major impact on the Armenian people, but also on the themes expressed in 20th century Armenian American literature. And I give these kinds of uh, names for some of the themes. The themes of the absence of the father, for instance. Uh, how the family is portrayed in Armenian American literature. And other general themes which are both common to American literature, but also specific to Armenian American literature. The genocide, which began in 1915 and continued until 1923, nearly caused the physical and intellectual extinction of the Armenian people. Those not destroyed in the western part of the historic Armenian homeland were dispersed, adding their impact to an already existing diaspora, which now expanded dramatically in size. The representation of genocide in Armenian American literature leads to a shift in an understanding of Armenian identity for Armenian Americans. The protagonists in each of the novel, novels of the late 20th century authors has undergone a pronounced shift in ethnic identity, assuming a more symbolic Armenianness. This is something that I'll talk about tonight. The protagonists themselves face a paradox of identity. They were born in America, but had to live, were living in a family that unit that seeks to perpetuate Armenian identity. Their struggle to resolve the paradox is achieved through a change in identity during the process of development from childhood to adulthood. Learning about the genocide or the reception of the genocide narrative from family or through reading about the event precipitates the resulting self-examination that leads to the changes in identity. Tonight I will give an overview of some of the late 20th century Armenian American writers. But again, actually, if I were going to expand this lecture and we don't have time to do it tonight, I could also tell you about these first generation writers and about how they also incorporated genocide, but in a slightly different way than the second and third generation. One, one writer that's well known is William Saroyan, but he really doesn't talk about the genocide directly in his early works. It's not until the 1960s and 70s when he begins to write about the Armenian Genocide. And that means it took him almost 40 or 50 years of his life to begin to reflect back on, on that genocide and to be able to express it in his literature. The devastating effect of the genocide, uh, again, had an enduring impact on the Armenian people with hundreds of thousands of survivors driven from their homeland and establishing new homes throughout the world. It was primarily these survivors who immigrated to the United States, adding to the ar already existing Armenian community, estimated to be approximately 66,000 in 1914. By 1924, an another estimated 30,000 Armenians had come to America, so there were about 100,000 Armenians in the United States in 1920. They are predominantly Western Armenians, those who share a common identity, a, set, a shared sense of peoplehood based on their Christian origins, a common language with its unique alphabet and literature, and a cultural history of more than 3,000 years. Often their identity was with a specific village or town, which was also a form of attachment. Wherever the survivors established themselves, the genocide had a significant and continuing impact on their lives, and this was often reflected in the literature. Armenian authors writing after 1923 at first produced an Armenian language literature, especially in the genres of memoir and autobiography. The massacres and their immediate impact of family and community was a central experience in the lives of survivors and therefore was a major theme in these genres which expressed their memories and feelings. Such an influential event as the genocide has been inscribed in Armenian American texts both symbolically and also as a historical event as a discourse in some of these literary works. Appearing as early as in 1952, and it's again up on the board, Richard Hagokin, the writer, wrote a, a book called Far Away the Spring, in which he talks about his family's experiences in the genocide. And later, more famously perhaps, Peter Najarian's Voyages, which was uh, written in 1971, which was the beginning of a trilogy of works that Najarian wrote, which concerned his own mother and his own family, and the central theme was the genocide. I'm going to speak just uh, again briefly a, a little bit about these first generation writers to give a little bit more background. The first generation uh, of Armenian writers in the post-genocide era, both in the United States and elsewhere, wrote almost exclusively in the Armenian language. They were survivors who had been writers before coming to America and were part of a long tradition of Armenian literature. They would bring themes of village life and traditional culture with them to America, 
providing some sense of continuity in the literature. Some continued their earlier focus on describing life in the homeland before the genocide, while others evinced a preoccupation with preserving the Armenian culture in a diasporan situation. Although the genocide was a common experience, it was rarely expressed, and few writers were able to write a novel about it. Their experiences of immigration, alienation, and loneliness were integrated into their works. The challenge for these writers was to find a way to maintain the Armenian identity against the overwhelming impact of American culture. The first generation was secure in a sense of Armenian identity because they had been born in historic Armenia. And in sociologist Annie Bakalian's concept, uh, she has written a book which is called Armenian Americans from, from Being to Feeling Armenian, and it's based on a sociological survey of Armenian Americans. Her contention is that Armenian identity has shifted from that of the first generation who were born in Armenia, spoke Armenian, they considered themselves nothing else but Armenian, to a more symbolic sense of Armenianness in the succeeding generations of the second and third generation. They did this by establishing, they continued their Armenian identity by establishing institutions and organizations whose purpose was to perpetuate the Armenian culture. And the examples are all around us today. Churches, Armenian day schools, cultural and political organizations. Some Armenian writers were unable to reconcile with their past, to come to terms with it, and to be able to express it in a literary sense. The repression of expression, the inability to express fully the genocide, was partially a symptom of the pain suffered by the Armenians. The pain was caused by the continual policy of denial of the genocide by the Turkish government, especially after 1975. And this is a major factor why the genocide as a theme in literature continues to appear so many years after the event. I mentioned David Kerrigan earlier, and uh, Arno over here has some copies of the book. So I, I, as I'm talking tonight, I'll be naming some books and not telling you much about them other than to say that if you're interested in a certain aspect, you can go to that book. David Kerrigan wrote a book called Forgotten Bread, First Generation Armenian American Writers. Actually, he edited it. It's an anthology that includes the works of 17 first-generation authors. That's what I have up on the, um, on the board. And these works uh, are provided with an excerpt from the writer, a biography, and then also an essay written by a third-generation writer about the first-generation writer. It is probably the best uh, book that you could start with if you want to start reading American-Armenian literature, at least to give you an idea of the different authors and what they write about. The struggle was what the inner struggle was what motivated this generation of Armenian writers, whose major challenge was how to fit into American life. Leo Hamalian, an author and editor of Ararat magazine, says the following, quote, I myself once felt the weight of what I interpreted as opposing obligations, the American and the Armenian. In retrospect, I suspect that my own personal experience recapitulates a pattern of experience familiar to many Armenians both here and abroad, the necessity of coping with two diverse cultures, surviving the contradictory implications, and then trying to make sense out of the encounter." End quote. By writing in English, these writers had broadened their audience and brought Armenian literature into the broader realm of American literature. Another uh, critic uh, who wrote uh, a little booklet on uh, the first generation writers is Nona Balakian, and the book is called The Armenian American Writer. It's actually a very slim pamphlet, but it's one of the earliest works which also discusses uh, some of these early writers. Uh, and she reviewed the works of people like Saroyan, Levon Zaben Sermelian, Richard Hagopian, Emmanuel Varandian, Peter Surian, and Marjorie Hosepian. And this is what Balakian has to say about this central issue of Armenian identity. She suggests that they, the first generation Armenian writers, shared an interest in writing that, quote, always centered on the inner world of man, on his inner needs and aspirations, end quote. And perhaps this was because facing the burden of the genocide, as transmitted from their parents, was too great. So they turned to the exploration of their inner world. But the genocide was in their works, sometimes subtly, even as they were also influenced by the contemporary trends in American literature. Now, new generations of Armenians, the second generation and the third generation, did not experience the misfortune of genocide firsthand. And therefore, they utilized themes from the broader literary world 
but they also returned to the genocide. Both initially in Armenian and later in English, they struggled to come to grips with a past which was very far away in space and time, but which they encountered in their own families. The genocide affected not only the nation and the community, but also the family and the individual. Family relations especially were affected, as in Peter Balakian's Black Dog of Fate, where Balakian is unable to communicate with a father whose silence on the Armenians was almost complete. Only very light, late in his life was the father willing to really communicate with his son. The genocide then formed a mostly unspoken subtext, sometimes explicitly discussed later in the story, but always a factor. As English began to predominate as the primary spoken language of Armenians in America, English language newspapers and journals, such as Ararat, became a major medium for the dissemination of Armenian American literature. And just recently I uh, discovered that Ararat now is online so that you can go back and look online for the complete back issues of Ararat, which was first published in 1960. And uh, they have a very complete record uh, in, in a real sense of Armenian American writers writing in English. So I also would tell you, if you're looking for uh, writers, you can go to Ararat magazine. The number of writers began to increase, especially after World War II, but it was not until the 1960s, however, that English became the predominant language of literary expression for second and third generation Armenians. These writers provided an important stepping stone for the future, even as they continued to explore themes that were important to the first generation. Now I'm going to give you a little bit more background because I want to talk a little bit about immigration to the United States and how that also affected the question of identity, which later will be reflected in the third, second and third generation Armenian American writers. While dramatic political and cultural changes were taking place in the United States in the 1960s, new waves of Armenian immigrants began arriving, affecting identity in the existing communities. Relations between the various generations, as well as across the boundaries of the various subcommittees, reflected the new environment and the need to reassess long-standing assumptions of identity. In the late 60s and especially in the 70s, immigrants were primarily from the Middle East, from Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Israel, and Egypt, following the eruption of the Lebanese Civil War and the political upheaval in the region. This generation was composed of the survivors of the genocide and their children and grandchildren, who had grown up in a predominantly Arab and Muslim culture. Though there were, though there, though there were a large variety of religious and ethnic groups in the region with their own long histories, the dominant influence was the Arab culture. The genocide, however, was a central axis for identity for these Armenians. Because there was no system of public education, the Christian Armenians were educated in the Armenian day schools and expressed themselves in their primary language of Armenian. Their expression of identity was one that was partially imposed from the outside by the group, the state, which recognized Armenians as a minority, but also by traditional aspects of religion and language, that is, the, the boundary set by the community itself as to who was Armenian and who was not Armenian. Their outlook and views were therefore different from those Armenian Americans who had already been born in the United States or been in the United States for two to three generations, and different in significant ways from Armenians from other regions of the world. The next wave of immigrants was uh, from Iran. Many of you, I think, are probably from that community, uh, mostly coming immediately before or following the Islamic Revolution of 1979. They had lived in the Persian Islamic culture for nearly four centuries, with a differing sense of identity than Armenians in neighboring Arab countries. However, Armenians, Armenian was their first language, and they were clearly a distinct and recognized community separate from the dominant Persian culture. They had not experienced the genocide firsthand in Iran, so it was not as central a formative issue in the construction of identity as it had been for immigrants from the United States, or from the Middle East. The third wave of immigrants is from the Republic of Armenia, uh, beginning in the 1980s. By the way, I left out a couple of these, uh, and I was reminded of it in Fresno, because we have a large community in Fresno of Armenians who were the so-called DPs, the displaced persons, who were uh, in Germany and had been brought to America. And I didn't mention it, and someone said, why didn't you mention the DPs? So I'm telling you that there are other groups from other areas, but I'm just looking at the major groups in terms of numbers. Uh, the Armenians in the Republic of Armenia had different backgrounds. Uh, nearly half of the population were descendants of genocide refugees from Western Armenia. But they had a common bond of Russian cultural and political domination from 1828 onward, 
and later the experiences of 71 years of communism from 1920 to 1991. Uh, their worldview was formed by events in the Soviet Union, by the Stalinist purges of the 30s, by World War II, by the Armenian repatriation of 1946 and 47, and by the changing political and cultural influences in the Soviet Union. They did not experience the genocide again in the way the Western Armenians had, although they faced their own very significant difficulties over the years. We'll come to that in just a moment. The writers from all three of the different immigrant communities continued to produce literary works after their arrival in the United States, primarily in Armenian. They brought a new outlook to many cultural institutions, newspapers and schools, and revitalized other organizations Bringing, them, bringing with them their sense of identity, which was developed in the societies where they had lived. So after 1915, the genocide, in a sense, became the defining event in modern Armenian history. And the question became, how is it to be written about? How was one to make sense out of it, to develop a coherent view to enable the Armenians to psychologically survive the catastrophe? Some had physically survived the genocide, but they also had to psychologically heal. The Armenians had successfully been able to absorb many previous blows throughout their history to maintain their identity. There was something in the literature of that earlier period and in the Armenian ethos which provided the people with a reason and a hope for living. I'm going to kind of skip this uh, section, but uh, Leonardo Alishan, uh, a writer who, tra who died tragically a few years ago, uh, wrote very, very nicely about this issue. And his thesis was that the Armenian literature from the earliest period in the 5th, 6th century always provided a model to the Armenians for survival. You know, 5th century with Vartan Mamigonia, with Yerishe, and other writers uh, along the way. However, there has been no way for the Armenians to reconcile what has occurred to them in 1915 without the admission of responsibility by the Turkish government. The campaign of denial by Turkey, which intensified after 1975, made it especially difficult for international recognition of the genocide. That experience, the catastrophe, has not healed, and therefore art, the creation of literature, could not be as productive. Without understanding of the event, without transcending it, nothing could be, nothing could be made sense of. Another reason for the inability to directly write about the genocide was the incomprehensible nature of the crime and the shock that it produced in the population with many people simply unable to recover. Now I'm just very briefly going to discuss some of the literary changes that are the social changes which took place in the United States and then we're going to go to our writers. A literary critic Hachi Tololian, speaking about William Soroyan, mentions that the conflicting pressures under which Soroyan worked could not be fully expressed until only the last several decades of his life. That is the 1960s and 1970s. And that greater freedom was due to the great social changes that took place in America, which allowed for the change in literary approach. The 1960s were a crucial period in the social and political history of the United States. Groundbreaking in comparison with the relative social stability of the previous decade. The first major change to take place was in the political arena, which was both influenced by and also influenced the popular culture. The election of John Kennedy, John F. Kennedy in 60, 1960, and the presidency of Lyndon Johnson were significant, as Kennedy brought youth and optimism into American life, but J Johnson's contributions had a more enduring impact. It was during his administration that the Immigration Act of 1965 was passed by Congress, which opened up immigration both in terms of numbers admitted into the country and also in terms of diversity of place of origin. Between about 1924 and really 1965, uh, there were very few people that were allowed to come into the United States from foreign countries, including Armenians, only with very special circumstances. But after 1965, the doors opened. The Civil Rights Movement also strengthened in the early 1960s, leading to a change in the perception of what it meant to be American and who could be included in the, in the concept of being American. Ethnic groups gained a greater sense of self-awareness and appreciation of the contributions of all groups to America. And I don't know if you could, uh, some of you may remember back, but I remember very well in the 60s that Armenians even were coming out with buttons that would say, you know, proud to be an Armenian. And uh, other ethnic groups also began to do that. And they couldn't really have done that before the 1960s. So the social changes 
allowed for a greater expression of, uh, of the ethnic element. There was a growing pride in attachment to an ethnicity and to identity. No longer was being a minority, or in the case of the Armenians, an ethnic group, a hindrance in achieving various political, economic, and social goals towards equality of opportunity. Author Peter Balakian asserts that it was in the 1960s and 70s when there was an intellectual and political culture that had an understanding of trauma, survivor experience, and the importance of cultural memory that allowed Armenian American the American Armenian experience to fully be expressed. The culture of the civil rights movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the rise of feminism, these all created an atmosphere where Armenian, Arme Armenian American authors could write about the Armenian genocide and about identity. At the same time, in 1965, Armenians throughout the world began to reassert memory of the genocide with mass demonstrations taking place in Yerevan and in other places and in a short time, the genocide memorial was constructed, also in Yerevan, and memory of the genocide was reawakened. In the United States, it was groundbreaking literary works by Alex Haley, Roots, and Michael Arlen Jr.'s Passage to Arara, which were the breakthrough novels in the rising awareness of ethnic identity. And I think it's very interesting, and I'm not going to do much of it but, uh, in this paper, but I would say to you that also it's very interesting to compare Armenian-American literature of the 1960s and 70s to other ethnic literatures of the same period to see the trends that are both common and different in those ethnic literatures. The third generation Armenian-American writers in English are a product then of American culture but also influenced by Armenian culture. They are part of the diaspora and their identity is formulated in a multi-layer form with many factors affecting identity. So much was lost in the Armenian Genocide, family, homes, businesses, cultural monuments. But perhaps it was the enormous loss of cultural transmission that has been the most difficult to recover. The first step in recovery has to be a return to history. The Armenians must confront their history to go back into the past to recapture the symbols that contain so much meaning for them and infuse them with a new meaning that is both of the past but also of the present and the future. This must be done through literature, through the telling of stories, as history alone cannot accomplish it. These symbols, or cultural value, values, could not be transmitted through the normal channels because of the loss of fathers and mothers. So many Armenians lost their parents or grandparents or uncles and aunts that the cultural transmission was interrupted from generation to generation. They, therefore, they were remade, that is, the transmission was remade into a contemporary telling to communicate with the next generation. The language that can retain the symbols and the stories that have been written or told are allegorical stories of the past, filtered through the minds of the protagonist of the literary work and passed on to the next generation or even to the grandchildren. It's very interesting that the authors to be discussed tonight often use the character of the grandmother as the means for the passage of this or transmission of this knowledge to the grandchildren. And the child sees the world not in a literal narrative, but in a metaphorical one, which is why fairy tales and stories are so popular for children. These stories remain with the children until they mature, and then they can begin to reflect upon them in their own writing. Many writers, uh, there are many varied responses to the genocide, and this also constrains the various forms of construction of identity for the Armenians. Uh, many Armenians reacted differently to the trauma that they had endured. For some, they chose not to speak of their experiences to, quote, protect their children from reliving the events. And I think the best example of this in Armenian American writing is Michael Arlen Jr.'s Passage to Arara, in which Arlen Jr. embarks on a journey of self-discovery, to recover the past, to recover and understand the pain of his father, so that he can make of himself, so that he can make sense of himself and forge his own identity. His, fa his father tells him almost nothing about his Armenian identity. So the book is really about his own self-study and his own embarking on his journey or passage to understand about his own background in order to understand who he is. Arlen's book, His Father Too is Absent, Unwilling or Unable to Transfer the Individual or the Collective Memory of His People to His Son. Arlen uses the family as the vehicle for his reconstruction of identity, but it is through an understanding of the genocide and its impact 
that leads him to a better understanding of his own relationship with his father. And there is a, a comparable story I was reading in, in, a, in an English story, a Chinese short story written in English, called The Old People and the Old Story. And it's a story about this uh, Chinese family and the tri tribulations they suffered on the island of Taiwan. The father at one point, in answering to his co child's question as to why he had not told him about the past, about the tribulations, said it this way, quote, Sometimes the best way to protect the people we love is not to let them know everything, let them forget the past, unquote. And I think that is one reaction in the range of reactions to the genocide in Armenian American literature. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. Memory is uh, inextricably tied to identity. The individual must place themselves in a the context in order to make sense of their identity. Armenians must delve into history and knowledge of their own community past. The genocide is still ever present. Therefore, in order to remember the victims of history, not only those of the genocide, but all victims, this is a crucial act which takes place in Armenian American literature. The authors that I will discuss tonight, then, share a common search for ethnic identity. Their works provide a means to plumb the depths of their own identity through the characters that they present. It is the it is the dilemma of the immigrant who must face the question of identity from two perspectives, from that of his home and that of his adopted home. For the third generation writers, the search of understanding identity continues. And it is just this struggle that exists and expressed through the pages of the novels that I am going to uh, touch on today. They will be studied, the text will be studied and exhibit a great degree of what I just mentioned, the search of the past in order to be able to make sense of their own identity. So let's start with uh, Peter Balakian. That's the first writer that I will uh, discuss uh, tonight. And uh, you have a list of some of his uh, works, but he is well known for his 1997 Black Dog of Fate, which is a novel centered on the author and his interactions with family and friends from childhood to adulthood. A central theme in the novel is the genocide and the effect that it had not only on the author's family, but also on the inner world of the, of the author. The genocide had become a major theme not only much later in 20th century diasporan literature, but compared to, themes, compared to themes found in the earlier literature written in Armenian. These later writers explored the impact that the genocide played in their own and their parents' lives. David Colon, who is another uh, scholar and critic, has often called this inner effort to produce literature to express the genocide he calls it the struggle to create the great elegy, a poem mourning the dead. And this is a particularly apt analysis, I think, for Balakian, because he is also a poet. Several of those works on the, on the board here are works of poetry. He initially was a poet, and then he began to write uh, novels and other forms of work. Each generation of writers in America had their own particular set of challenges that confronted them. But the third generation of, of writers removed by time and physical distance far from the actual events of the genocide, born in America, had to go on a long inner voyage of rediscovery to reclaim memories and identity. The inner archaeology of Balakian's search is one of self-understanding and coming to terms with his own family's experience. Lauren Sherinian, uh, another critic, says it this way, for Armenian diasporan writers, the genocide still appears to be the context and background for much of their work. It is, always seems to be there in diasporan texts, either directly as an illusion, as an image, or as an underlying metaphor. Loss, exile, dislocation, alienation, ethnic marginality, disempowerment, and continuing trauma are just some of the central themes of this literature. Perhaps in time this will change as the Armenian diaspora reconceptualizes itself. It may develop new elements of its identity that will not place genocide, loss, exile, and trauma as they are not now felt and understood as the key components of its identity. The locus for Armenian identity in Balakin's book is his maternal grandmother, Nafina Arusian, who represents Armenia in both its real tangible meaning but also in the metaphorical sense. The interrelationship between the grandmother and grandson in the early sections of the novel are crucial in the young Peter Balakin's development of self-awareness as an Armenian. This strong maternal presence contrasted with a more distant male figure, his father, and I just mentioned about the absence of the father because I mentioned Michael Arlen. It's the same thing with Peter Balakin. 
This is a common theme in second and third generation Armenian American literature. The grandmother is, at the same time, a bridge between the two worlds, the old and the new. And she can understand not only her own world, but the new one of the young man. The contrast is also between the men and women in the novel. And it's a very clear contrast. Balakin must find a way to reconcile them. In the span of this work, the author's self-awareness changes quite frequently, as does his own sense of identity. For the purposes of this paper, the premise is that the genocide still plays an important role in Armenian diaspora and literature and the form formation of identity. It is a collective symbol which binds Armenians together. For Peter Balakian, the knowledge gained of the genocide brings with it a sense of empower empowerment and self-awareness of his place in his community and in society at large. His, his distance from Armenian identity is embodied and emphasized through a conversation with his mother. Armenia. It was such an unconscious part of my life that I'd never even thought to ask, where is it? What is it? My mother exhaled again. It's in another country. Armenia's in another country? No, Mount Ararat. Well, both. Armenia and Mount Ararat are in other countries. But we're American. That's the main thing. We're not like other Armenians. They're too ethnic. Now, that's his mother speaking, and his father is already absent. So you can see that at the beginning here, Balakin has a hard time coming to terms with uh, his Armenianness. The book is divided into six major sections, each of which explores a significant inner archaeology as part of the author's journey of self-discovery. It is toward the end of the book that the genocide begins to play a more important role, and that is in the fifth section, which involves his own search and discovery of his Armenian roots. And while he's in graduate school at Brown University, he takes an odd job as a delivery person over the summer, and he thinks to keep himself busy by reading a book. And the book he chooses to read is uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's story, which begins him on this search for more information about the genocide. Uh, Ambassador Morgenthau's story is a historical account told through the eyes of Morgenthau and pro provides a first-hand account of life in Constantinople and in the Ottoman Turkish Empire in 1915. It describes the Armenians and the Turks, their relationship, and it also provided Balakian, through historical context, with more understanding of the question of his own identity. Therefore, his research uncovers the facts of the 1895-96 massacres, as well as the more well-known 1915 genocide. He begins to become more interested in finding out about his grandmother and her life story. He immerses himself in that story, he discovers more and more about it, and as he learns more about it, uh, he becomes more interested in his own identity. In a more personal and intimate way, he now begins to understand both his grandmother and his father more fully through the experiences they had just to survive. He had to learn about Armenian history in order to understand the context of the life his grandmother had led. And she was the person he had the closest relationship to and was the keeper of the family history. Thus, you can see that genocide, I'm going to not talk more about it at this point, but the genocide is a central role in Peter Balakian's uh, history. The second author is going to be uh, Peter Najarian, who's, uh, I mentioned, a trilogy of works which has at its center the Armenian Genocide. I'm going to discuss a little bit from his 1986 Daughters of Memory. And I, I consider Najarian to be one of the most important of the Armenian American writers because his novel includes uh, a very long tradition, I think, of diaspora and Armenian literature but also is significantly different in content, style, and structure from earlier Armenian-American works. For Najarian, the genocide is living with him in the person of his mother, Zarohi. So this is very different than Balakian's uh, work. Zarohi is open and direct about the history that she endured, and Peter Najarian is constantly aware of the genocide in her conversations, especially with her friends. Memory and its perception are the tools used by the author. He explores the genocide as his constant companion and seeks to understand how it affected his and his family's life. The genocide is a major focus in his work. Another main character is Melina, another survivor of the genocide and the mother of another character named Zeke. And Melina's memories of what occurred during and after the genocide also form a large part of this story. And the theme of genocide was touched upon in his earlier work, Voyages, where he includes a discussion of his own father, a figure who 
whose presence was not felt much in the family due to illness. Again, the absence of the father. This, uh, Peter Najarian's father in real life had a stroke in his 40s and died very soon thereafter and never really communicated with Peter Najarian about his identity. But it was his mother, Zarohi, who was the center of his uh, life. Uh, some critics, such as Lauren Sherinian and Margaret Bedrosian, have commented insightfully on Daughters of Memory from the perspective of a no novel that reflects the collective symbol of the genocide in literature. While acknowledging the role of the genocide, I also examined the role of art and imagination in the context of the formation of identity in a longer written version of this presentation. Najarian's writing articulates the crucial matter of how Armenians in America view themselves and their ancestors. He writes with an urgency and a compelling voice, and his words seem instinctively to be able to convey very powerful images. It's a Daughters of, Mer of Memory is a continuation of his earlier works, and in his own words he says, quote, each one of his previous works has the same narrator at different stages of his life. In Voyages, he is a young man trying to find both an identity and a way of living in a country where he feels alienated all of which leads him to search for the father and a patrimony he feels he has lost. In Wash Me On Home, Mama, he is a bit older and has become concerned with the need for a family of his own. And at this stage, he takes on the collective voice of the commune in the late 60s, and the people there become part of himself as he tries to integrate uh, them into his literature. The genocide, therefore, is a major locus in the discourse that takes place in his novels, and the core of his work revolves around the concept of integrating second and third generation Armenians in America with their past. He is attempting to resolve the generational difference, to bridge the gap between the immigrant generation and those who followed and had become acculturated. Therefore, he seeks to reconcile a violent past, the genocide, with a present that is as uncertain for him as the future. Although the novel has elements that are a continuation of traditional Armenian literature with a focus on family and customs, it also represents a major departure in Armenian American literature. My next author is uh, Mikulin Aharonian Markham. And again, these books, by the way, are uh, out there on the table, most of the books that I'm mentioning. Uh, Mikulin Aharonian Markham wrote the 2001 Three Apples Spell from Heaven which revolves around a family living in historic Armenia, and then follows them through the horror of the genocide. The main prota protagonist is Anagil, whose story concludes with her survival and later life in Beirut, Lebanon. Markham's spare but evocative prose draws the reader into a world of the real and the remembered. The novel captures in 54 chapters, their brief chapters, the memories and life experiences of an Armenian family living in Kharpert historical Armenia during the late Ottoman period, on the eve of the genocide. And Markham begins her novel weaving a web of memory and history, outlining the early beginnings of Armenian history, but also touching upon the genocide. Drawn from the author's own grandmother's experiences, Markham attempts to make sense out of that which is un incomprehensible, an event, the genocide, which has left a deep impression in the lives and psyches of the Armenians. It is an event that is still being examined and studied in order to understand its widespread, widespread impact on the Armenians. Markham's characters must struggle with identity throughout the novel, as she herself does, since her own grandmother was raised in the Turkish family, and she is constantly aware of both her Armenianness, her differences from American society, and also her adopted family's attempts to acculturate her to a foreign way of life. For Markham, who is accustomed to living in the United States, she must also face the challenge of recognizing her own identity and to understand how the journey she has taken in writing the novel will help her bring clarity to her own life. Therefore, literature is a means to express the deepest feelings of the individual. And the creative author uses history, here through the eyes of her own grandmother, as a method to recreate a world from long ago. The genocide remains empty without form and substance, a place where there are no longer any people. This is from her work. The, the work also has the feeling that all of the people are gone, that there is no way to bring them back, to reclaim their humanity, except through memory. The genocide was a rupture between the past and the present, a chasm across which it is difficult to cross. Literary critic Mark Nishanian has characterized the genocide as a catastrophe which may also be defined as the final event of the dramatic action 
especially of a tragedy and also a terrible disaster. It is the absence of being and of feeling. It is here, therefore, where memory becomes most important, as it is all that remains of the lost world. There are no physical reminders of that world. Families have been torn apart, and only memory remains. And it is this point, it is at this point that Markham steps forth to weave her densely filled vignettes into a moving and unforgettable story. The next author that I'm going to uh, briefly discuss is Nan uh, Nancy Krikorian, whose work, uh, Zabel, in 1998, is another novel which is based on the genocide and family. And it covers three generations of that one family, the Charles Vanyan family, as they struggle against both societal forces, America, and their eventual assimilation into the larger American society. The main protagonist, again, is the grandmother, Zabel, a genocide survivor, who must deal with its impact in relations with her own children. Excuse me. <clears throat> Nancy Krikorian is a third generation writer whose work can be placed in a group in the group of authors whose works have been heavily influenced by the Armenian Genocide. Her work is not a history, it's not a memoir but it is a way to recreate memory, both at the individual and collective levels. She must delve into her grandmother's world in order to make sense of her own life and identity and to make sense of the genocide. This novel is informed by the genocide, which took the lives of more than 1,500,000 Armenians and put an end to the collective existence of the Armenians, who had lived on that land. In brief, the genocide destroyed the homes of the Armenians, and that is the meaning of family, because destroying the home was also a means of destroying and rupturing that memory in that family. Her novel follows the life of Zabel Chalasvanyan in an arc from old age. At the beginning of the book, the grandmother actually dies, and then it's kind of a recapitulation of her life, starting from childhood and then forward to adulthood. The reader begins to understand the inner world of this strong woman, who endured and survived many tribulations. Zabel was a victim of the genocide, even worse than what some of the other examples of the uh, genocide survivors have, that I've talked about in, in the other books. And the trauma of that experience remains with her throughout the story. The genocide, by destroying the physical homes of the Armenian people, also destroyed an important center for identity. The survivors were to face the difficulty of assimilating that experience and the challenge of being able to recreate homes and family in distant lands. For Zabel, and by extension for all the Armenians who were exiled from their homes, the challenge was to find a way to reintegrate their lives in a place, the United States for example, that was very different from what they had known. In doing so, they also had to form a new way of looking at the world and a new way to identify themselves. Sometimes that transition was difficult, and their children, as their children were born in the new country and became accustomed to a different identity in the public world. So it's that tension between families. And the final author that I'm going to uh, discuss tonight is David Fergian, who is uh, a very prolific Armenian-American writer. He has dozens of books uh, to his name, and I've put some of them for you. And I'm briefly going to discuss his one novel called Asking the River which is a, a novelette written in 1993, uh, which captures the Armenian experience in America and the difficult adjustments required to come to terms with life in America. <clears throat> Along with his other works, it explores the impact of the genocide and how that theme became extremely important for later writers. Diaspora is central to Khergin's sense of identity, as it was to his family. Although ge genocide was not explicitly referred to early in the book, it is certainly the reason that his family had, quote-unquote, fled their homeland. Having to establish roots in a new country gave his family a lifelong feeling of fear and insecurity. And Khergin shared his family's sense of living in exile, the palpable sense of potential persecution. He wasn't very comfortable living in his hometown of Racine, Wisconsin. Quote, I never felt at home in Racine, not as an Armenian and not as an American. Although, of course, I didn't know that for a very long time that I was American, or even that this earth, this place of my birth, was America." End quote. Kherdin expresses a hybrid identity, with his Armenian self being exhibited while he was at home, and his American sense 
expressed while at school. And it was this delicate balance which left the young man in a very precarious position. Uh, a little bit later in Asking the River, the protagonist is a young man named Stephen Bakayan. And uh, it follows his life from childhood through school and his experiences with his childhood friends, family, and with those school, school friends. But the genocide is ever present in this story. Although perhaps more subtly expressed than, some of the, than in some of the other works that I have discussed. The genocide is not explicitly discussed except in several brief passages, but never as a historical event. However, it is an experience, the genocide is expressed as an experience that has had a broad impact and is central to the development of the entire work. For instance, Stepan says, all the Armenians ever said about all the Americans ever said about us was that we were the starving Armenians, which in their mind was anything but fascinating. They talked about us as if we didn't exist, like we were so far away in their minds that we were nowhere at all. Well, those starving Armenians happened to be my relatives. This was during World War I when the Turks tried to get rid of all the Armenians living in the country. End of quote. So he brings in the genocide uh, from that angle. The genocide is only obliquely referred to here because starving Armenians was a common ref reference to the Armenians by Americans in the 20s and 30s. However, the genocide is clearly present in the reference. And Stepan knows this well, as his family has suffered losses on both sides, with his, mother's, his father's mother having died of starvation, and his mother's fam ha family having been nearly eliminated during the genocide. If Stepan is still trying to make sense of his identity for his mother, it's very clear. Quote, Listen to me, I want you to be a proud Armenian. We are a great people with a great history. We were the first, to first nation to adopt Christianity. End quote. So she is transmitting to her own son valuable cultural views as she explains the sacrifices that her and previous generations had made for the children. In a reference, uh, let's see, later here, I just mentioned that already. He, Stepan represents the second generation of Armenians born in America and facing the challenge of finding himself. In reference to his mother, he says, quote, She was a foreigner, but I was an American, or rather an Armenian-American. Did being both make me neither? I wondered, what, what was it that was my nationality? Either? Is that why I was always uncomfortable with myself, with my parents, and also with the Americans? So it's clear that his mother, his mother, it is clear, already has one identity, Armenian, which in America is seen as being the identity of a foreigner. For Stepan, however, his statement is the crux of the entire book, the search for understanding of identity and how to resolve the dilemma. His Armenianness and his sense of being American must be resolved so that Stepan's very uncomfortableness is based on his inability to resolve the crisis. Tonight I have presented several examples of Armenian-American writers who have incorporated the Armenian genocide in their works. And these are representative of some of the major trends in Armenian-American literature. Armenian-American authors have continued to incorporate the themes of genocide into their literature, even as their own self-conception of identity is changing. The authors are still exploring their memories and how this has affected their identity. The genocide is a recurrent theme, ascribed especially in the genre of the novel, and is reflected in the literary discourse that dominates English language writing. Thank you. After the 1960s, writing about the genocide in English, no, I haven't actually. Uh, in, in terms of what I've been doing, I've been looking more at the second and third generation Armenian writers. But certainly, there are there are writers who are, are doing that. So I can't really speak to it directly, but it is something that needs to be looked at as well. Any other questions? <laughs> 